Heavenly Father, we want to quiet our souls before you. I thank you for this time of the year where we have a margin built in that if we will just take the time, <laughs> Father, that we can be renewed, that we can be reoriented to where we need to be, to consider the incredible gift of your Son to us. Father, forgive us because... <laughs> We should be falling on our knees and declaring your greatness because Jesus Christ, you are, you are king. Lord, I ask and pray that as we look at your word, as we enter this season, that you would do a, a really wonderful, fresh new work in each of our lives individually and in the life of this church. Father, that we would be a people who are in awe of our Lord and Savior. And if there's someone here today who has not yet responded to the King, not yet received that incredible gift, I ask and pray that your Spirit would open their eyes to see the profound need that there is no other hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. And for those of us who would say that we have received that gift, Father, I pray that we might better understand that Jesus is king over everything or he's king of nothing, that we would respond to him as Lord, as king over our lives. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to see you this morning. And we are beginning our Christmas sermon series. Um, it feels a little bit cooler today, but it was somewhat, we had a great service last night. Just a little odd when you're going through a Christmas service and you're sweating before you come in, you know, it's just, that's, that's San Antonio, right? Um, we are going to look at some pretty important things today, very important things, okay? And I want to encourage you, because the challenge, I think, during a Christmas season is, is that for many people, it will be like uh, the idea that I've heard so many of these Christmas texts before, that kind of a thing. It's like, well, I, I've heard this, I've heard that. And the familiarity with it all um, sometimes causes us to... Um, kind of go through the motions when I think that what we profoundly need is to be awakened. We think of Christmas and we think of that child in the manger, right? That's one of the images. Are you awake? Yes. Okay, just want to make sure. The child in the manger. And, and then when we, what's interesting to me is that when we talk about the Lord Jesus Christ, if you are a Christian and if you have grown up studying and you know your scriptures, you know that he is fully God, fully man as he walks this earth, right? And this is fully God, fully man. And so the thing that is a challenge for many people is the idea of, of, of which side. Sometimes they tend to, to gravitate towards one, either to the point focusing on his divinity so much that they can't understand that he truly did experience all that we did experience as humans. He knew what it was like to be hungry, tired, and weak, and tempted. Or the other extreme in which... The focus is so much on the humanity that they, 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 they forget just who this is we are talking about. The Son of God. Okay? God the Son. And I think that, that in our current climate, that's really the big thing that, that I guess the error which so many Christians and, the, and churches have, have kind of swung towards. And I'll, and I'll show it to you this way. It's not just the baby in the manger. And we think of that as that warm, as a beautiful, and that is a, a, a heartwarming, fuzzy thought, right? It's amazing. And then you look at Jesus in the Gospels and you start to think about how we, we, we view Jesus in our culture. And we've talked about before, he's kind of the, um, the willowy, 60s, gentle, you know, little guy or whatever. So almost, it seems, we have this unusual idea in which... Um, that child in the manger, we, just, we don't stop to think who it is we're dealing with. 
Okay? So we're going to take a look at a passage today that was written some 725 years before Christ is born, not created, before he enters into our human condition, born of a virgin, okay? Written some 725 years beforehand that describes who he is, what he is like. And today I will simply say this. There is a king that we must bow to. There is a gift that we must receive. And one of the great, great needs in our churches today in our country today, amongst those who profess the name of Jesus, is to stop treating Jesus like he's some kind of a personal assistant and to start acknowledging him as king and as sovereign ruler over all. Okay. I'll try to wind down because I'm going to get amped up a few other times, okay? <laughs> this is a heads up. Because I get really excited about what we're looking at today. And I pray, I pray you do too. This is serious business. You see, the challenge, I think, that with this little image that we have some time of, uh, of Christ in which we, we consider the, the small child in the manger, which is amazing when you consider this is God the Son. All the way to the hippie Jesus, who's pretty harmless and benign, is that we have a Jesus who's very manageable. He's not much of a threat to us. You might say, well, Jesus isn't supposed to be threatening. Well, I will submit to you that, yes, he does in this way. As king of kings and lord of lords, I don't tell him what to do. I don't give him terms. The king is the one who gives the terms. Does that make sense? <laughs> So I think that's one of the reasons why we lack this sense of awe and wonder is that we have a Jesus that is far too manageable, and he is not the Jesus who is. He's not the Jesus that we see in Scripture. And so we find ourselves lacking all sorts of things from peace, joy, wonder, awe, reverence, because you know, this is Jesus. Well, let's see if we can address again who it is that we are looking at and who we're talking about. Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. Isaiah speaks of the coming Messiah. Now, there are many prophecies of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Old Testament going back all the way to Genesis chapter 3 from the moment that we first rebelled. Isaiah has much to say about him. And you can just write this down and look this up on your own time. If you have any questions, if you're a, uh, in that category of a skeptic and what you're saying, I don't know if I believe all of these things about Jesus. 725 years before he is walking the face of this earth, Isaiah writes about him. Write down Isaiah 53. Just read through that. And then I want you to consider when you read that, what are the statistical probabilities or even possibilities, if it's even possible, that someone could write in such perfect detail about someone's life exactly, exactly as Isaiah did. So now he gives us a snapshot of who it is we're talking about. There's a gift to be received today. If you have not received that gift of the Lord Jesus Christ, today is the day. And there's a king to bow your knees to today. Okay, Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with, and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is a prophecy, a Prophecy of the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and of his kingdom, of his invisible kingdom, and ultimately of the coming rule of Christ on earth. You do realize there is coming a day when there will be a new heaven and a new earth, and Jesus Christ will reign physically forever and ever. Right now, he is ruling in the hearts of men and women. Okay, I'm just, that was a broad category, so no offense meant, all right? 
throughout history and all over this world, all who have bowed before the king and who have acknowledged him as Lord and Savior, he rules in the hearts of men. His kingdom continues to expand and will always expand, will never, ever, ever fail, and we will reach that glorious consummation on that day when he will physically reign. This is who we are talking about. So let's unpack a few things in this passage. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. The language is very important here. To us, this is important. This is a gift given. This is a gift that has been given. Knowing about the gift does not put you in a right relationship with God. Knowing all about the gift does not put you in a right relationship with God. Knowing all the facts about the gift does not put you in a right relationship with God. You must receive a gift, the gift for anything to change. And if you have not personally humbled yourself, and here's the, here's the thing is that, again, it's how we view Jesus. You do not see Jesus anywhere in Scripture walking around saying, gee, I, again, we've talked about this. I hope you'll like me, and, and I just really want you to be nice, and just, you know, let me uh, be your, 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 your friend, that kind of a thing. He is king. So when he walks through the Gospels, you see him saying things, take up your cross and follow me. You, get up and go. That kind of a thing. And so you don't see him saying, you know, well, let's negotiate our terms. His terms are simple. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. The king says that. Okay? That's who we're talking about. So to receive this gift means that I repent of my sin, that I recognize that I am a wretch who cannot save myself, that I throw myself at his mercy, and I receive that gift of grace. It's not me doing him a favor by saying, yeah, I, you know, I prayed the prayer. Oh, no. If that's, and that's where a lot of your testimonies, if, if, that's, if that's where it is, if that's your testimony, I prayed the prayer. Well, well what else? What, what, what's... This, is, this is a scary thing. I've seen it in churches all over the place over the years. For a lot of people, that's their testimony. That's it. What's he doing in your life now? How are you growing? How is he changing you? How are you learning how to trust in him? How are you worshiping the king? How are you following him? And just blank stares. I prayed the prayer. Nowhere in Scripture will you find the little magical prayer. I hate to break it to you. This is an exchange of your life for His. So again, if you've not come to the King on His terms, you need to do that. If you're trusting in something that you just uttered and had no effect on you, it's not like Jesus said, wow, he knew the magic words. Even though he really didn't mean it, he said it, so I'm stuck with him. <laughs> we come to him and we humble ourselves. He's the king. We don't have another hope. To us, this is a gift that is given, and you must respond to the gift. The Son is given. From eternity past, it's the plan of God. God the Father to give the gift of God the Son to sinful humanity, to his rebellious creation, to we who have sinned and run astray, to all of us who have offended the Most High God. God pursues us and gives the gift of his Son. Now, let me ask you this. I asked it last night, and I was kind of tripping because I thought, wow, y'all are a lot better than me. I had like three or four people that raised their hands, and I was like, okay, I've never done that. How many of you love to give gifts to people who hate you? <laughs> no, I'm going to call you up on that. I'm going to talk to your parents and find out exactly who hates you and see if you give them a gift this Christmas, Mike. I'm going to call you on <laughs> Someone who has offended you, who hates you, who goes out of their way, let's, let's up the ante, who goes out of their way to make everything an offense against you personally, who wants nothing to do with you, okay? This is who we are to our Father. All of we like sheep have gone astray. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and there is no one who seeks after God, no one. There is no one righteous, no, not one. Romans chapter 3, read the whole thing. That's who we are. And yet God says, I'm going to pursue my creation. That's amazing. And he doesn't just give a gift. He gives the very best that heaven can possibly offer. 
the son willingly coming. So we see here the word son is used in this text to show the relationship between father and son. So the gift that is given and a gift that we do not deserve. We don't deserve this gift. You see, when we have that mindset and we understand that I in no way deserve this. What I deserve is judgment. I deserve God's justice. That's what I deserve. And so do you. And yet God gives a gift. The very best gift. God the Son, <laughs> the eternal God the Son, leaves the glories of heaven and enters into our human condition. This is the child that is given. This is the son that is given. He is given to redeem us because he comes to die. Jesus said of himself, he said, no one takes my life from me. <laughs> so I willingly lay it down. I've come to give my life as a ransom for many. Jesus comes to die. And we have talked about this uh, every time that we go through the Christmas season for a reason. I want us to understand that that that. that <laughs> We do love the images of the child in the manger, but there, the shadow of the cross hangs over that manger because that's why he comes, okay? He doesn't come just to be a good example. He doesn't come just to make us feel nice. He comes to willingly lay his life down and to endure God's holy, righteous wrath against my sin and your sin. He comes for that. For to us, a child is born to us. The son is given. This is who he is. This is why he comes. And now we're going to notice that the infant given, the, the son, the child that is given, we're going to transition from that to the king who reigns and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords, his reign, as we have spoken about, uh, has been throughout history, is all over the world right now, globally, individually, person by person by person. He is still saving. People are still bowing their knees. People are still crying out for mercy. And the Lord Jesus is redeeming and saving people unto himself from every nation, tribe, and tongue. He is building his kingdom. The government of the entire world also rests upon him. Guess what? Jesus is in charge of everything. This son that we're talking about, this child in the manger, he reigns over all things. He rules. This is who our Jesus is. And again, I think sometimes that we forget exactly who it is we're talking about when we talk about that child in the manger. So let's talk about, let's take a look at who this Jesus is who willingly came and gave his life for us. We're going to take a look at a few things about what, or said, what things said about Jesus, from Jesus, his own words, from Paul, and from John the Revelator, the Apostle John, okay? About the Lord Jesus and his reign, the government that he rules over. Who is this king? Well, first of all, Jesus said this in Matthew 28, 18, he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So how much authority does he have? All. All. You know, sometimes you look at the world and you say, man, things are getting out of control. It's just crazy. Guess what? Jesus reigns over all of it. No one's overthrowing him. He is leading everything to that glorious moment when everything will be consummated in the new heaven and the new earth. He's not up there trembling and shaking. He's not freaking out. He's got authority over all things in heaven and on earth. There is no place you and I could go. There's not one place anywhere in the universe, in the entire cosmos, where Jesus Christ is not Lord. This is who we're talking about. This is the child who is given. This is the son who is given for us. Listen to the Apostle Paul, Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore God has exalted, highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Ooh, he's the king. That day is coming when every created being, every man, woman, every child, 
every principality, every power will bow before the King of Kings and say, you are King of Kings. You are Lord of Lords. The sad thing is, for most, I didn't say many, but for most, that moment's going to be too late. Because what did Jesus say? He talked about a, remember the, the wide road? Remember the narrow road? Jesus said, how many were on the narrow road that actually found life? Few. On that broad road that leads to destruction are many. And the sad thing is, I hate to break it to you, there are many in our churches on that broad road. And they're thinking because they've been in church, because they know facts, because they, they try to be a good person, that they are on that narrow road. Unless you have been born again, unless you have personally responded to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, unless you have repented and placed your faith in Him, You're on that broad road. Sitting in here, I want you in here. We want you to worship. Corporate worship is a huge part of what it means for us as Christians to grow. But sitting in here doesn't make you a Christian. And you know the old joke, any more than sitting in your garage is going to make you a car. And some of us have that mindset. Well, I'm, I'm in church. Okay. But where's your life? Where's your heart? I'm a good person. No, you're not. <laughs> Sorry. None of us are good. <laughs> there is a gift that's been given that must be received. There's a king that must be acknowledged. And he reigns over everything. I don't know when this started, but there's some people that kind of live their lives this way. I, I, I think, and I, I told them last night, and I think they concurred, so maybe you'll concur. Maybe if I'm wrong, we'll talk, you know, whatever. But I think it started with George W. Bush when he was elected. Remember the hotly contested election results after George W. Bush was elected? Remember that? All that stuff. And so he started this, there was a movement that started. And you see bumper stickers, not my president. Remember those? That continued through out George Bush's term. It continued throughout Barack Obama's term, and it continues now. So now this is a thing, right? And it's a way for someone to go, yeah, I'm sticking it to the man, resist, so on and so forth. Okay, guess what? I hate to break it if you're one of those persons, but your failure to acknowledge whoever the president is does not change the objective fact that person is still the president, right? A lot of people live their lives of Jesus that way. They might even know some things about him. They read about it, and it's like, well, that's not, I'm, not, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to respond to him that way. Or you find some people who's like, you know what? That's not my, it's not my God. Uh-uh. And then you find the atheists, and I've heard this, I don't know how many times, and you talk to people, it's like, yeah, well, you know what? If I was a God and I stand before him, I'm just going gonna, gonna to ask him questions. I'm going to this, that, and the other. Why would you do this? And why would you allow cancer? And why would you allow so on and so forth? No, no, you won't. You will be in such holy fear pleading for your life, and it will be too late. He is King of kings and Lord of lords, whether you and I acknowledge it or not. Okay? Jesus is not running around saying, gee, okay, well, I, you know, if there, my approval rating is not so good, so I'm not so much the king right now. No, he always reigns. So the question is, how are we responding to the king? Have you responded to the king? Who are we talking about? This is the one who has the government resting on his shoulders. All authority is his. One day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is king of kings and lord of lords. And then one of my favorite texts. Again, this is that same child in the manger because we have that bizarre idea. Sometimes I think that like Jesus from eternity past, God the Son, really amazing. Jesus uh, after he ascends to heaven, really amazing. And Jesus, the child in the manger is just, you know, just kind of a willoughby, whatever. And he's not still fully God and so on and so forth. He's, he's, just, he's just fully man. No, he's still fully God, fully human. He's still fully God. So this is the same Jesus in the manger. And this is going to trip you out. This is one of my favorite passages. And we'll preach on it sometime. But most people don't like it because it kind of freaks them out and scares them. But that's okay. We need a view of Jesus that is accurate. This is who we're talking about. So Revelation. This is the Apostle John. Revelation 19. This is the same child in the manger. 
okay? The same one that some of us think that we're going to manage. I don't have to respond to him. I'll do things my way. Okay, let's, let's talk about the one who's going to come back. The one who reigns over all things when he comes back. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Some of us don't, but what, 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 Jesus makes what? His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself, and he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God, and the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses, and from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty and on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's that child in the manger. That's our King. That's the one who has the government on his shoulders. He never will not reign. He reigns right now. So I will just, I will plead with you in all love, if you have not yet bowed, if you're not, I'm saying you are king. I need you. I can't save myself. I can't do anything for myself. Lord, I, 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 I need you. If you've not done that, I plead with you to please respond to the king. Do so before it's too late. Okay? And then for those of us who say, again, that we are Christians. Oh, yes, 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 I, I am a Christian, and uh, I do. I, maybe, maybe you do more than just, you know, you come to church, you come to church, and you, uh, you have daily devotion, so on and so forth. Let me ask you a question. If he is king of kings, and if he is lord of lords, and if he reigns over all things, then that means that he should be the one who reigns over our daily life right now, right? He's not someone that we just consult with every now and then. He reigns. And so for some of us today, because I know what some Christians, you know, we're all prone to do this. We Christians sometimes will think, sure hope so and so is hearing this. I need to hear this. Okay? You need to hear it? I need to hear it. So if you're thinking about your neighbor, your spouse, your sugar booger, your person next to you, or you're looking across the room thinking, golly, so and so in here, I hope they really hope they hear you. Just stop. All of us need to come to terms with the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord, and He is to be Lord over our lives. Amen. That means a lot. Okay? There's not an area of life that His Lordship doesn't touch. There's not one area of your life that He doesn't put His hand on. I forgot who, was it Lewis? I can't remember. He doesn't put His hand on and say, that's mine. And you know what a lot of us have done? We try to grab that hand and take it off and say, no, 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 that's mine. That, that, that's my free time. That, 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 that's my future. That, th th those, are, those are my goals. Um, that, that's my money. That's, 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 that's my, my, my stuff. You, you see what I'm saying, right? It's not treating him like king. This is the gift of Christmas, that tiny infant, the child in the manger, is the same person that we have just read about who has all of this power and all of this authority, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. This is that child. This is why I am in awe of the incarnation. God the Son coming to us as he has for that purpose, to lay down his life. I don't deserve any of that. I've got to respond to that. So do you. And let's go back to Isaiah 9. The prophet continues to describe Messiah, and he says, and his name shall be called. Now, in the little list of things that follow, these are descriptors, not personal names, okay? And so his name shall be called. These are descriptors of his character and, his, and who he is and what he does. First, wonderful counselor. Some translations separate that as wonderful and then counselor, but it's best understood as wonderful counselor. 
He is a wonderful counselor because he reveals the deep counsel of God. He counsels us from the perspective of God the Son. Not mere human thought, not mere human opinion. This is the counsel of God. God the Son. So if you want to know what wisdom is, if you want to know what you're supposed to do, how you're supposed to live, you can go to the Word of God. And receive wonderful counsel. He is our wonderful counsel. These are the words of God. And yes, that refers to God the Son too. Colossians 3.16, Paul goes so far as to say, let the word of Christ dwell richly within you. We need his word. And one of the great concerns we have again, professing Christians, oh yes, I love Jesus. And he's my Lord and Savior. But I never do talk to him. I don't listen to him. I, mean, I don't read anything. I, I don't let him speak to me. What higher privilege is there than to be in relationship with the king and to be able to, to read his word? That's amazing. He's wonderful counselor. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach. That's why James says we can go to our king for wisdom, for counsel. You can walk right in, not because of who you are, not because of who I am, not because of our inherent righteousness, but because of the righteousness of Christ, we can walk into the throne room of grace and receive help in our time of need. We can ask for wisdom. We can ask, we, we can ask the Lord to grant us the wisdom that we don't have. Lord, what do I do? He's spoken through his word. He speaks through his spirit. The Lord is an amazing king. And here's the, again the test. If you say you're a Christian and, and we all, hey, I freak out sometimes too, right? I mean, we all do. We, we all have moments where we kind of forget who's on his throne and we freak out. But here's a concern. There are a lot of professing Christians who are running around like chicken little continually. That's all they do. Oh, dear, what are we going to do? Oh, I don't know what we're going to do. Oh, my, oh, my, oh, my. He's king. You belong to him. He's not going to forsake you. He's not going to leave you. He promised to take care of all your needs. He said he's never going to let you go. He's going to complete the work that he began in you. He's going to actually bring you home to him. There's no one that can separate you from his love. There's nothing that you will ever go through that's too great for him. There's not one challenge you will face or we will face as a church that God looks at the Son of God and says, ay, 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 what do I do? No, no. You see, I think a lot of us are freaked out and we don't have peace and we don't have that sense of confidence in him because we don't know him. We know stuff about him. But that relationship is not there. He is wonderful counselor. He is mighty God. This is an incredible statement about Messiah. This is God the Son, not just prophet, priest, and king, not just a, an incredible man. This is God the Son. That's who we are talking about in the manger, the one who will come to willingly lay his life down for us. The mighty God, the all-powerful God, the Son, all-powerful, nothing impossible for him. We affirm it here, but do we believe it here? Are we able to rest to you reign? You are mighty. And I'm going to praise you for that. I'm going to rejoice in that. This mighty God, God the Son, is the gift that is given. God demonstrates his love for us in this while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. The gift comes to die. God on a cross. He will actually be called everlasting father. That's better translated the father of eternity. 
All the ages meet in him. He is over eternity. He is eternal. He holds all things together. The Alpha, the Omega, the Ancient of Days. The one who has always existed, who was not created, who has always been, will always be. That's the child in the manger. That's the one who comes to lay his life down. That's the one who gives terms. Okay? Follow me. That's what he says. This is the one who chooses to take on flesh and dwell among us. Isaiah says this is another descriptor. He is the Prince of Peace. Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace because one peace will characterize his reign in the hearts of men and ultimately on earth. He's the one who gives us peace with God. There is no peace with God apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. We are at war with God apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. All of us are. He's the one who allows us to be reconciled and to have peace with our Creator. He's also the one that gives us peace from God. And again, here's another thing, Christians. I want to ask you this. And I, I, still, I still stumble too, okay? So again, I, every time we preach, I preach, I'm preaching to myself first, all right? So please know, I'm not, I'm not saying, I, I never, I'll put it this way, I will never and have never, and if I ever do, then I pray that I'll walk away or, or, or publicly repent, prepare any message thinking about, okay, you know what? This is where I dig so-and-so right here, doesn't it? Because I've had some weird stuff over the years, man. I think someone might have been a little bit upset before, thinking that, you know, and, and did you write that because of me? It's like, well, no, actually, I, no offense, I wasn't thinking of you. I was praying and researching. I wasn't thinking of you, and actually, I was studying for this. Um, but that, to me, is an affirmation that the Word of God has power to convict, okay? So just know, I'm not, I'm just going to share with you Okay? Something that, that was really convicting to me when I studied. Okay? The Prince of Peace. Oh, man. I think you can, you can kind of figure out an application point. Oh, dear. Oh, my. Oh, my. Oh, golly gee. Yeah, things are really bad. I don't know. I don't know. I just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Things are really crazy out there, and all the man, finances are tough, and I'm having this, that, and the other going on, and uh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, things are just bad. My circumstances are bad, and oh, my dear, and so on and so forth. Or it's the Eeyore thing, right? Remember Eeyore? And we talked about him before. Oh, bother. Nothing ever works out fine. Man, there is no peace for a lot of people who say they know Jesus. Something's wrong. Something's really wrong. And I'll tell you what it is, I believe. I think the root of that is this, is that there is a very small view of who the Lord is. He is not seen as the King of kings and Lord of lords who reigns over all things, who is the mighty God. The everlasting one, because a small Jesus, for most of us, if we're honest, when our Jesus gets to be really small, our problems are so much bigger than he is. There's not one problem you and I have that should rob us of our peace because Jesus is greater than all of them. Now, do we really believe that? If we do, here's what we do. We go to the Lord and say, Lord, you said cast all my anxieties upon you. You may remember that. So we will have anxieties, right? We're going to have stresses. So I'm going to cast all my anxieties upon you because you care for me and you are able to do whatever you want. So I'm going to come to you because, Lord, this is too much. I can't carry it. So, Lord, here it is. Now, if we did that, we would be able to have peace in times of turmoil. But far too many professing Christians have zero peace, again, because Jesus is either this big or there is no real relationship. He is a prince of peace. Do you know him? We conclude, verse 7, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. His kingdom will never stop. It will never cease. It will always continue to advance. No one is going to stop God's plan. That's pretty powerful. 
There will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and uphold it. This is from the line of David. Jesus is from the line of David as prophesied, and he will reign forever and ever. It says here, to establish and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and evermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The zeal of the Lord God, the zeal of the Lord God will accomplish his purposes. His purposes will never fail. They cannot fail. The kingdom continues to advance. The king reigns. So how do you respond to him today? This is the king that we've looked at today, the Lord Jesus Christ, promised from long ago, who is our only hope. And he comes to us just as was promised throughout the entire Old Testament. And this is the one that we talk about in the manger when we sing these incredible songs about God coming to us in the flesh. He is worthy of all worship. He is worthy of bowing the knee. He is worthy of confessing King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And have you given your life to him? Have you responded? Have you received the gift? And Christian, Christian, is he Lord over your life? Or is he someone that's kind of like a personal assistant? I got news. He's no personal assistant. Today is a great day for us to start off the Christmas season as we consider the gift of God the Son by humbling ourselves before Him, worshiping Him, responding to Him, all of us. We're going to bow our heads and we're going to pray and sing a song of invitation. And during that time of invitation is an opportunity for each of us to respond to the Lord as he may be working or leading in our lives. If you were here this morning and you have not yet given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, you've not yet laid down your arms, so to speak, and surrendered to him and received that gift. Today can be that day. And if you're at that place where you're saying, you know what, I, I do want to give him my life. I, I just, I, I, I want Jesus. I want to know what that means. Please come forward and we'll pray. We'll set up a time to meet. We'll, 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 we'll walk through all of that. If you're looking for a church home and you believe this is where the Lord wants you to be, and you want to be on journey and mission with this church community, then please come forward and say, yeah, we want to join with the church here and we'll set up a time to talk about that as well. Yet others of us may just want to come forward and pray here <laughs> and worship the king. Maybe some of us need to lay some things down and just say, Lord, I'm going to leave this with you and walk out of here <laughs> knowing that I've left them with you. However you need to respond, let's just do that today. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for the gift of your Son. Lord, you did not give us anything but the absolute best and what we absolutely did not deserve in giving your Son. He reigns over all things. And Lord, I ask and pray that each of us would respond to the King as he is worthy of being responded to. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.